The following presentation was recorded live at the Richmond Marriott in Richmond, Virginia for the 29th Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers Convention. This is tape number 15, Multi-Cycle. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dana Shermer. I'm from Topeka, Kansas. And I'm happy to be moderating today uh, a topic that I feel is very important and very useful. Uh, I've been giving sessions on one of the panelists for the last four or five years. And uh, I guess I graduated up to the moderator this year. So it's nice to have you all here with us. The, the topic is multi-cycle lesson plan. It's exciting because it is a useful tool. It is seeing a lot of success. Maybe not as much as we want to see, but more than, than uh, some of the other callers are experiencing with just regular one-night, one-session lessons. So we're very happy that so many of you have taken interest in it. Just out of curiosity, how many in the room right now is doing multi-cycle type of lessons? Quite a few. We've had more that had not tried it, so they could benefit in this uh, this uh, ideal, this concept. For those that may not quite understand yet what multi-cycle is, the ideal is simple. We are trying to present lessons at different times a year. So many clubs start in September, and if you can't take in September, well, you have to wait until next September. And uh, that's limiting. It, it keeps us from capitalizing on dancers and people that want to get into score dancing that are not able to start at one point of the year. The concept of multi-cycle means that we start lessons at different times of year, capitalizing on the present class, moving them into an the lesson plan, as I proceed through the lesson plan, start a new class so these people that are in group A started, they can be angels for this group B started, and uh, also help market. I think most of us agree some of our best marketing people are the people in our current class. They have the most enthusiasm. They know the people out there that that are not square dancing at this point, and they have a better chance of selling those people into getting them into square dancing. So... It's a good concept. It works very well once you get it started. It's not something you start today and say, well, gee, it didn't work well. It's got to progress. It's got to start. You've got to commit to it. You have to spend a lot of time developing it. But once it starts rolling, I think you'll see successes. We sure did when, when we had ours going, and I think uh, there's a lot of success stories out there. Um, Mike Seastrom from California has one very successful program going um, where they actually – they're developing quite a few new dancers a year and retaining them. That's another key point of this program. It, it helps you retain the dancers because if they don't quite get all the way through the lessons, have to back off for a while, there's a starting point they can come back in again. And uh, if they don't quite understand the dance yet, if they didn't quite get all the information uh, learned at the time they went through lessons, then they have a capability of going back and, and going back through that session again real quick and learning it. So it's a, a very useful tool. We have a lot of people in the room, like I said, that already are doing some programs like this, and I'm sure what they're here to help share with us those ideals, but they're also here probably to share a little bit, uh, to learn a little bit more about how they can enhance their own programs, and we're, uh, we hope we can provide that information. This year we have two new panelists that have not participated in the panel before, so we have some new ideals coming out, and uh, we're going to get them on real quick. I'm going to let them have the chance to talk. We're going to let both of them talk. They both have a session of about 10, 15 minutes each, I believe. And at that point in time, after uh, the last one has given their presentation, we'll open up the microphone for questions. As you probably realize, this, ta this session is being taped, so we want all questions on the, on the microphone so we can answer and get it on the tape. We don't want any blank spots on the tape. Unless it's derogatory, then we will shut the tape off. Okay. <laughs> But uh, um, my first uh, panelist comes from Laurel, Maryland, has been a Caller Lab member for many years. We're very happy he's with us today. His name's Kenny Ferris, and here's Kenny. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Kenny Ferris, Laurel, Maryland. I've been calling for um, over 30 years. I started teaching classes in 1970 uh, before, while I was in high school, taught some classes while I was away at college. Came home from college and taught classes for clubs for a few years, 
And since the uh, early 1980s, I've been teaching classes not for clubs, but just teaching my own class, running my own class, and then feeding clubs. I call for three-plus clubs and a mainstream club. So basically, I'm feeding the mainstream club. But eventually, you feed your plus clubs, too. Um, since the early 80s, I'd, uh, I've been teaching at this place called the Adelphi Mill Recreation Center, which is an old grist mill built in the 1700s, turned into a recreation center that the Park and Planning Commission uh, operates. And... Uh, it's really hefty rent if you rent it, but if you're teaching classes through the county, you get 10% of your take, and it works out pretty well. <laughs> um, for, for about 17 years, I taught there by myself. I would teach classes and hope that club members would come, from the various clubs would come and help Angel. And there was another square dance club that my parents actually belonged to that would meet there once a month. So once a month, I had an alternate location. And towards, uh, after a few years had gone by, I said, you know, I wonder what it would be like if we both worked at the same time, because there are actually three floors in this place. So instead of going to an alternate location, I started uh, keeping my class there, but we'd go upstairs and let the club that met there once a month have the main floor. And it worked out well that you could have two programs going on at the same uh, building, which led me to think, wow, you know, if we can have two programs going on at the same time, hmm. So eventually that club... Um, it aged and uh, folded, and after they folded, I contacted the two gentlemen in the back, Virgil Forbes and Jim Wass, and said, hey, how would you guys like to start one of these multi-level, multi-cycle um, programs like they're doing in Virginia? You know, Mr. Steve Stevenson over here uh, has, uh, was the instigator for a similar program in Virginia, and we got some ideas from them. So we, what we did was we had three floors, three callers, and three programs going simultaneously. And as you can see from your handout, uh, we start in September. Did everybody get a handout? They're up here if you'd like to get one. We start in September, a, a beginner's class on the main floor. Of course, we have a couple of first-nighters to get interest going. And then on, on the second floor, we have a mainstream review. And what that basically is is getting people used to square dance to come back. We had to have something for the third caller to do, right? <laughs> So we, we, uh, this works really well. We, we've had, I think every time we've done that, we've always had uh, at least a square of retreads that we got back into the activities. It's been very worthwhile running that program. We just do that for eight weeks. We run on an eight-week cycle. So the first eight weeks, we got the beginners going on one floor, this review going, and when that, first, that review is done in eight weeks, they're square dancers now, and they go join the clubs uh, that they want to join. I'll go off dancing, or they can obviously stick around an angel. And also, during the first eight weeks, we have a plus workshop going on another floor. And that's going to go for two sessions, not, not just eight weeks. Actually, we go about 14 weeks. We give them a little break there. Um, actually, we end, end that early so that by the time January rolls around, we will have that hall free to do a couple of free first-nighters in. But then November, the second eight weeks starts. The mainstream review is completed, so we start a new beginner class in that hall. So now we have a September class, a November class, and then the plus workshop is going on upstairs. January rolls around. The plus workshop is done. Now, we're, hopefully, we get a January class, and we've got three classes going, the September, the November, and the January class. And in March, the September class graduates. That hall is freed up. We have a plus workshop, but not for the September class. We don't, do not encourage them to go take plus right away. All three of us call for mainstream clubs, and there are other mainstream clubs in the area. We invite all the club, mainstream clubs to bring flyers and members to our graduations and, uh, and advertise and make announcements about their mainstream clubs to get these people to dance at them. And, and so far, it's been quite successful. Uh, we always get a few that want to go ahead and take plus. Some of them are real go-getters. Go Others are retreads anyway. They wanted to start at the beginning. Um, but we don't do not push plus on the new dancer, and uh, we find that the retention rate is a lot better. They'll come around next September, and take plus the next September, and they'll stick around though for uh, the March and April sessions and Angel, the Janu the November and January class, and get even more confidence. And it's worked out really well. The first three years were quite successful. I don't think we missed a class at all the first uh, three years, maybe, maybe one, one, one November class one time we, we didn't get. Um, this year was not a good year. Uh, we had a September class. We had a square. Um, we ended up with three couples. Then uh, the mainstream review worked great. We had a square, and they're all still dancing. Uh, the plus worked well. We had uh, maybe, I think we had two squares in our, in our fall plus uh, program. 
and they're all still dancing, that we did not get a November class. So that kind of left a hole in the program there. And so we ta started taking turns. We actually got a night off once in a while. <laughs> so there's good and bad to this. And then the bad news is we didn't get a January class either. Now, it's not that nobody showed up, just not enough for a square. And we just really didn't want to, you know, in November we said, well, come back in January because you only got to wait eight weeks. And uh, in January, some of them came back. Some of the same, it just it didn't work out in January either. So it's unfortunate that um, recruiting-wise, we're not doing a very good job. But the concept uh, worked well for three years, and we're really uh, pleased with what, it's, what we've done. And while I've been lamenting to the guys, like, it doesn't seem like we teach anybody, uh, kind of like, oh, me, oh, my, oh, lippy. <laughs> and then we get to the Waska. We had the Washington area has their big festival in March. And uh, Jim commented to me, he said, look around the room, Kenny. And I looked around the room, and by gosh, there's a lot of people out there that have been through our programs. And I, obviously you see them at your own clubs, but to look around the room, the folks that aren't at your clubs, but they're still square dancing, that was very rewarding. So I, I think we've got a good thing going. And uh, one of the good things is with the three of us uh, have different teaching styles that complement each other. And... Um, uh, let me go back and say the first three years, whoever started a class finished the class. Uh, in other words, you stayed with your, with your class the whole way through. And every three or four weeks, we would swap classes for a night just to give the dancers uh, some variety. This year, we decided, let's not do that. Every three weeks, we just the dancers stayed where they were, and we, we swapped places. So this year, the, the class that we actually graduated uh, earlier this month was team taught. Every three weeks, they had a new caller. So all three of us are the uh, uh, proud teachers of, the, of this recent graduating class. And it was kind of neat. And they're pretty good, solid dancers because they got different. You know, they didn't get all my little idiosyncrasies or gems or Virgil's different ways. They, they, got, they couldn't get stagnant because we all have our, our ways of calling. And I, we think that really worked well. Um, I guess that's about all I got to say, except now we do have a... A few years ago, if you remember, uh, there was a suggested mainstream teaching order that uh, got voted down by Caller Lab, but we, it was put out there for about a year to, to uh, go for people to try out. And we've pretty much stuck with that, a few little modifications, but uh, our, the, the three of us have, have continued to use that teaching order, and it's on the back of the uh, flyer there that you have in your hand. And uh, the main thing we see helping to allow us to teach mainstream in 24 weeks or three eight-week sessions is the progression. We, we teach veer left, uh, lead to the right, and veer to the left early on. And once we've taught veer left, we can teach ends trade, centers trade, ends circulate, centers circulate. And boys, and, well, usually you do the boys and girls concepts first, but then ends and centers and couple circulates. And by the time you get into ocean waves, maybe five or six weeks later, it's a piece of cake because they've already done trades and circulates and things like that. And we find that you can really teach classes. You don't have to take uh, 30 weeks to teach uh, when, when you introduce these concepts early. And that's what's worked for us. And um, I think that's all about all i got to say about it. And well, we'll entertain questions after this gentleman, Randy, is done. Hey, thanks, Virgil. Oh, I thought he was up here with me, not you, Kenny. <laughs> I, I, okay. think Dana, I think Dana wants to uh, give uh, uh, me an introduction. So. Yes, we'll give you a little bit of int introduction here. And then we'll have questions afterwards for both moderators. Plus, we also have, as I said, a few success stories throughout the, the room. And some have already volunteered to share that with us. Um, just from what Kenny's given me. Already, there's a few questions I'd like to present to the three callers that are present here on their program, and I'm sure uh, there's probably other questions throughout the room. But if you try to hold those for us, we'll get to them when uh, they get through their full presentations. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our next uh, moder our next panelist, I should say, from Danbury, uh, Connecticut, Randy Page, who's also uh, experiencing a lot of success with the program, and also. Um, is a Caller Lab accredited coach, so we're happy to have him with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, I think the first thing I want to talk about is that just like everything else in the world, that 
if you don't innovate, if you stay remaining the same, eventually things aren't going to operate properly anymore and your uh, amount of success is going to decrease. And I think we've seen that in the activity. And my model of multi-cycle is very different from the one that Kenny has presented. However, the fact of the matter is they're innovative. And if you look at the Caller Lab document, it will show you there are many, many different ways to do multi-cycle. You don't have to do what we have done. I think the real key here is that we have to innovate as leaders. We have to find what works in our own area and then go forward. I see multi-cycle as literally a change in the culture of the activity. It's a change in the way that we teach. We certainly heard Dana referring earlier to, to commitment. What happened at the club in Danbury where we've been doing this for six years was uh, six years ago we only had one square in the fall class. They had always had a square and a half, two squares, three squares, but every year it kept spiraling down and down and down. And we sat down and had a meeting with the executive board. I had presented them with the idea of multi-cycle before because I'd heard Mike Seastrom talk about it many, many times. And they finally said, well, we have to do something. We're going to do it. You can't go in with an attitude that, oh, we're going to try it and see if it works out. And if you listen to what Kenny said before was they didn't make a decision that, oh, we're just going to try this. They made a decision to implement a new program. And that's exactly what we did. We made a decision. We weren't going to try it. We were going to do it. And it's worked out better than any of us uh, could ever imagine at that point in time. The first year we did it, we had eight couples in the fall class. We only had six couples in the spring class. But what really surprised us was the spiral that's occurred every year since then. Uh, this past year, the club was a little disappointed. Our fall class wasn't as big as the year before. We only had um, 20 couples in our fall class. Couples. And they were disappointed because we had had more than that uh, the fall before. And what's really happened is that the entire attitude of the club itself has changed drastically. We used to have trouble getting angels. It's easy to get angels when you're dancing six, eight, nine squares on a class night, as Chris Pinkham will be telling you later, too. There is an entirely different attitude. There's a different perspective. Uh, many times I find there's a morbid feeling in a lot of clubs. They know that they're dying and they don't want to change, but they keep saying, well, what do we do about it? And I'm not saying that my model, which I'm going to go into now of multi-cycle, is the way for your club to do it. But take a look at the Caller Lab plan. Take a look at the plan Kenny has. Take a listen to the one I have, which is very similar to Mike Seastrom. Uh, if you look at my document about frequently asked questions, I did that from a perspective of answering dancers because our problem doesn't really seem to be callers. It's dancers who are already in the activity who will insist that this cannot possibly work. And so this gives you a few of the uh, responses that uh, I've given in the past because they say, oh, you don't have enough time to teach the calls. You don't have enough time. You have more time than you ever did before because we develop synergies that I will go into in a little more detail that take advantage of this multi-cycle program and allow it to continue to build upon itself. I want to go back one more time and talk about the change in culture. We've seen a uh, big reduction in what I would call level snobbery by using the multi-cycle plan. I think that's one of the biggest problems we have in the activity. People finish mainstream and they feel they immediately have to go on to plus. 
they feel like, well, we just have to keep going. We have to keep moving forward. And one of the things that happens in multi-cycle is one of the early lessons they receive is, oh, you have to go back. That's part of the program. It's part of the way that we run it. So to describe the program that we run, we start in September. We run 15 weeks. And we have what we call our cycle A's who have just started. And they'll go for the first hour and 15 minutes. And then we have our cycle B's who starting from September started the last January. It's actually, it's a year-round program, but they started the last January. And they're finishing up in the fall and they're basically completing uh, what was the uh, mainstream portion of the program and the cycle A was doing was what was the basic portion of the program. But if you think about it, when you're teaching the mainstream program or you're teaching any of your programs beyond the basic program, a lot of your time is still spent going back and teaching basics to those dancers. And what this program allows you to do is intentionally, and as, as, as it's a requirement of the program, is repeat all those basic calls a second time. It enforces angeling. They're expected to come to the entire session. But it also saves me time because the time that I would normally spend during cycle B repeating the correct way to do square through or the correct way to do right and left through is not spent during that time period. I have to spend more time keeping records. I work much harder, not just doing checklists, but making notes to myself for the next week. Because if I need to repeat square through with my cycle B, well, they're all going to be there during cycle A next week. And I'm going to program that in to my cycle A program. So that means that I'm getting double for my time. Because I'm repeating it for one group, but I'm teaching it to the other group at the same time. So we're not going back and continuously repeating calls with the second group. Another factor that we've observed uh, is our cycle B program only runs an hour. Cycle A runs an hour and 15 minutes. And we have 15 minutes in between, which is announcements. Once in a while, we'll do an angel tip to keep them happy. And we'll do a styling session quite often for both groups at the same time before we send our psycho A's home. And actually, we don't send them home. We welcome them say, hey, stay and watch. And they get a taste of what's coming up in the future. So it's, it's, it's really been uh, neat. There's uh, another factor that we never considered walking in the door when we started it. And it happened to us on the... Uh, 2nd September we started the program we had a couple couples come who used to dance 8 or 10 years ago to our session and they said well why don't you give us a call when your class is far enough along and you know by that point in time you know maybe we'll come back and start dancing again and my feeling has always been you call those people in January when you're ready for them to come on and they've lost interest but we don't tell them that anymore. We say, oh, you can start tonight. Because what we do with our retreads is we have them take cycle A and cycle B simultaneously the same evening. Because they can handle both programs. And that way they get a full review of both the basic and the mainstream programs. But since they're not learning the material from zero... They're just reassimilating it. You know, you all know that they learn more quickly. It gives us an opportunity so that they start in September and they're dancing with the club in January. So we're giving the club dancers more quickly and we don't have to run a separate program for our retreads. We just pump them right through the same program. Another factor that, again, we didn't anticipate. 
How many of you uh, have taken round dance lessons? How do round dance teachers teach their lessons? They teach on the same night, at least in my area. They teach an hour and 15 minutes of easy, and then maybe they go on and do an hour of intermediate rounds, and they have it in the same night. The interesting thing that happens is people take the basic rounds and then they take the intermediate and they find it a little bit tough. Does that mean they stop coming in the door? No, they just stop coming to the intermediate session. Well, the same thing happens with students taking square dancing. These people bring their friends in January. They start in September. They bring their friends in January. They get to March and they're having trouble doing some of the mainstream calls. And so instead of walking out the door, they just stop coming to cycle B. But their friends are all there dancing in cycle A. They don't have to leave their friends. They can continue to dance with their friends. And when the next cycle turns again, they can move forward. So the way I like to think of it is it becomes self-paced. Now, there are times that we suggest to people that they might need to repeat cycle A. But they don't have to wait till next year. They can start immediately. So they never leave the activity. The problem I think that we really have in terms of retention is that we allow people to leave. And then they don't want to ever come back. But we don't want them to leave. We want them to dance in a program that's comfortable for them. So in, in essence, the way the club itself has taken a look at it is that we now are three clubs in one or holding programs all in one and that uh, each program is viable by itself. Uh, when I was first doing the set of lessons, we'll talk about success in people and we'll also talk about success in dollars. Uh, my fee for lessons has uh, more than doubled since we started doing the program and the treasury of the club has quadrupled because they're no longer subsidizing lessons they're making money on square dance lessons um, like I said you know we had 20 couples a, a typical Wednesday night which is funny because it's the same night that Chris was talking about dancing this number of dancers uh, six or seven squares is a little bit on the light side it's not unusual to have eight nine we've even had 10 11 squares on class night and you want to hear a level of excitement and fun boy i'll tell you that uh, that's really a critical mass and it really makes a difference i think i basically uh covered an outline for you what my uh, program is so uh, we'll give this back to dana thank you randy thank you kenny very good presentations. We're going to open this up for some questions. Um, Chris wants to talk a little bit too. I'm going to have him hold the mic for us though first, and we're going to get some questions out of the, out of the way. Again, this session is being taped, so we want every question, every comment back on the microphone if possible. Turn on here just a second. If you'll start raising your hand, I'll, I'll make one quick comment. Uh, comment the um, the hand that we referred to, the multi-cycle lesson plan is available through the home office so for, the, for those listening on tape or those here that did not pick one up you can ask for it from the home office inside it gives you some ideals of how some of the programs work and also gives you some contact names of callers that are presently using this uh, this program uh, Kenny's name's in here Ron's isn't right now but contact Ron I'm sure his name's in the in the uh, information work, work. And uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to talk to you. One thing is kind of noticeable from both callers is the enthusiasm. They both have very optimistic views of how this program works. And uh, I think any of us that have used it in the past and, and looking forward to it in the future realize the benefits of it. And uh, that's one of the goals is to build our enthusiasm. From our enthusiasm, we'll get the enthusiasm the clubs involved and that has to hand on to the to the class people. Okay, the questions? Yeah. One, two. 
please. Give your name and yes, where you're from. Jim Wass, Riverdale, Maryland. And I have two questions for Randy, or one compound question. Uh, the pace of the lesson, when you're having a shorter lesson, an hour and a quarter or an hour lesson, uh, the pace of that in terms of uh, number of tips, amount of breaks and such. And you said that uh, each of your sessions was 15 weeks. Am I reading correctly? A school year with a summer off. We do, in fact, have a summer program on top of it, which is a, a holding program, uh, which we find that we have a lot of students from other clubs who uh, had trouble finishing the program or finishing the material who come and dance with us all summer because we're working on uh, basics and mainstream all summer. Uh, we average during the summer probably... Uh, six to eight squares still uh, on a Wednesday night. We have a, a hall that doesn't hold much more. Uh, we have an air-conditioned hall that's uh, from the town of Brookfield, so we pay like $25 a night for it. So it makes it really good. Something I forgot to mention before is that your cycle B, you notice, is 15 minutes shorter. Um, you have to warm up the cycle A's. The cycle B's have already been dancing for an hour and 15 minutes. You can just start and run with them because they're, they've been square dancing for an hour and 15 minutes. So they don't have to start at the beginning and get them warmed up. They're already going full speed. Okay. In terms of teaching pace, my uh, breaks are much shorter. That would be the, the biggest difference. Um, I would say the cycle B's will set out usually a couple of the cycle A tips because we're going along pretty rapid fire. On the other hand, the cycle A people at only going an hour and 15 minutes uh, find uh, this session to be quite invigorating. It's, uh, it's nice, it's fun, it's, it's fast paced. Um, when people come in to learn and they go to a college class or uh, to another class, Really, our time length at an hour to an hour and 15 minutes is pretty typical. And I really think in terms of giving them new material to learn uh, that we can cover all of it. Uh, one of the interesting things I have on the FAC uh, is the, the actual contact hours that we have is a lot higher than you think. Because most people say, oh, you're only doing an hour and 15 minutes. But then when you figure when they're doing cycle B, you're doing two hours and 15 minutes. And if you look at my sheet, uh, we're, we're up around 60 hours with our people. I, uh, uh, Doc Terrell <clears throat> from uh, Legacy. But I have one uh, question of you. Are you using your new dancers as, to promote your next class? Are you, using, are you presenting a program of uh, like a one-nighter where the older dancers can bring their new friends, their old friends, so to speak, into the square dance activity. Uh, and you can have a dance where they can show off what they can do at the same time that the new dancers can experience what square dancing is going to be. Exactly. You're right. We do. That's part of the principle of the, of the program is to have the, the dancers are going through the program right now promote new dancers coming in. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how these folks handle as far as bringing in a one-night party night for new dancers, but I normally would treat that as almost the first night of lessons. When they come in, they, they're coming in as the first night of lessons. And, uh, but I'm expecting the people that are currently in class to be those angels to come out and say, we're bringing some friends with us. Well, uh, I, w I would think perhaps where, when you're getting to where you're coming to the last session of uh, Part A or Part B or whatever uh, you're dealing with, uh, that you would prime your de dancers to bring their friends, bring one or two couples along with them, and we're going to have a party night. Actually, Doc, I'll take it a step further than that. They're usually clamoring at me as to when they can start bringing their friends. And I think we actually used to drop the ball by not doing multi-cycle. Uh, for those of you who don't realize, uh, Doc is, is a round dance cure, uh, certainly one of the finest in New England at this point, and formerly of New Jersey. And it's a case of where 
the round dance model I presented before is, is very accurate and why we as square dance callers didn't wise up to what you guys have been doing for years, I'm not sure. But uh, yes, we do remind our people and one of the ways I think we dropped the ball before is how many times in the past that we have our dancers come to us in November or December and say, well, we have some friends who want to learn how to square dance. And you take their names and you call them next September and the interest is ebbed. But we don't tell them to wait to November. We tell them, oh, I mean, next September, we tell them, yeah, you know, we have another set coming right up. Yes, bring your friends to it. Now's your chance. It also has what I would call a, a chaining together effect. And the chaining together effect is that having their friends as angels in cycle B helps retain the new people and the people in cycle A help retain some of the people in cycle B because they're doing it with their friends. Without looking at the calendar, when is your when does your cycle B actually start? In January, February, January. or January? It's basically follow up. it follows the school semester as uh, as Jim was talking before because we dance in schools. Chuck Jaworski, Chicago, Illinois. After a lot of effort, we finally got one club that I work for convinced that multi-cycle was the way to go. And the way we got that done was the school teachers became president of the club. They knew the value of education. Plus, when they attended the National in Anaheim last year, they attended the seminar on multi-cycle program. So we started. We're the only group in the area that does the multi-cycle. Most of the clubs in the school area do not have lessons at all and haven't had lessons for all. One of the strongest points I stressed was that the new people coming in would be the best recruits for the next class. But yet, Kenny, you've had two classes in a row that didn't work. Can you explain why or what happened? Or um, You pass the mic back to Jim. He can help on this. I'm not, well, I guess small begets small. I mean, uh, actually, the September class did bring some friends out, uh, just, just not enough of them. And... Uh, we can't really explain why. And also, we're not sponsored by a club, and we don't have the support of that many dancers. Uh, at the beginning, we did, but we burned them out because it was the same people all the time. Um, and we're not located where, uh, where our mainstream clubs are. Maybe that would help. Um, so that, that's, we're just not getting the people out. There's a lot of things you have to realize uh, has to happen. This is a, a useful tool, but it doesn't take away from the fact you still have to go out and promote. You still got to go out and make the the sales pitches to uh, the way you've done in the past. You've got to get the people in the door. The fact that we have people in the classes right now, that is a good tool to go out and get their friends and bring back. But at the same time, that can't be the only tool. You have to still do the same promotions, the same exhibits whatever you've been using in the past to, to help sell score dancing. That still has to be there. Um, and I think in, in some cases, when you get your program started, you have to realize that um, it's an ongoing program. And um, you can't just, you, you've got to continue building as you go. And if you let it slack one time, that means you've got to go back and build it again. And uh, it's not going to take off on its own. And it's going to take a lot of just nurse nurturing to get it going. Okay. I had one more question, too. Kenny, you're doing three classes in the same building on the same night. Right. What do you do with the class in the third floor needs a couple? And the class in the first floor needs a couple? I mean, and you're not sponsored by a club. You don't have any angels. Well, we do have angels. Oh, you do have angels. There, there a number of folks come pretty regularly. But uh, and it usually, believe it or not, works out. Uh, that, that we, we make the squares on every floor, and maybe somebody has to go to a six-couple uh, square on one floor. Uh, we've only had maybe one or two nights in, in four years where we, didn't, where we couldn't field a, uh, a square on one particular floor. But, yeah, we, we really could use angels. Another problem in the Washington, D.C. area is there's just a lot of other things uh, that people – there's a lot of options for people's time. I mean, we're really having a trouble recruiting in the entire Washington, D.C. area, and maybe Steve Stevenson would take a shot at this in a, in a minute or two. I, I, I want to take a quick shot at it, and 
we have actually refocused the demographic group that we're looking for. And the demographic group that we've identified that seems to be very interested in square dancing are um, baby boomers who have children who are old enough to learn how to square dance. A lot of them, are husband and wife, are both working. And they want time, uh, activities that give them time with their children. And we have uh, identified this. Uh, we dance uh, basically a square of kids all the time now. And uh, in our area, uh, we used to have lots of teen clubs 20 years ago and don't have any teen dancers. And now all of a sudden, they're coming back with this program. And it's really one. What's the youngest? Uh, nine. Nine years old. And the oldest would be uh, 15. We're seriously looking at, at perhaps moving uh, to a different location next year. The, the, the area where we live, there are very few English-speaking people left in that particular area. Uh, I mean, it's just the, the how things happen in a large metropolitan area. I actually grew up two blocks from this place, and I probably couldn't understand anybody. My mother's the only English-speaking person on her block. She still lives in the same house. Uh, it, and it's just... People that are coming to take our classes are coming and driving 45 minutes to an hour to get there. And we're, we're recognizing that perhaps next fall we need to move closer to where the people are that, that we might want to. I mean, we'd like to target these people, but they don't speak English and we don't speak uh, Vietnamese or Spanish. Clay. My name's Clay Goss. I'm from Newark, Delaware. Uh, Randy, uh, direct my question to you. It, it appears that your destination is mainstream. And uh, I'd like you to answer how you feel that might enhance your program as opposed to the ultimate destination being plus. Well, the, the destination is, in fact, plus. But what's happened is we, in effect, have a holding group within the club that is essentially mainstream. The club has admitted to itself that uh, uh, we can't be just a plus club. We can't be just a mainstream club, that we have to have... Uh, the ability for people who want to stay and just dance at a basic level. Uh, we have one lady who's been dancing with us just in Psycho A for uh, probably six or eight times at this point, and she has no desire to go on beyond that. But we're happy to have her, and she's having a good time. There is, there is I won't say there's no pressure to go on. I'd say there's some peer pressure to continue on. But from an administrative standpoint, our attitude is, if you want to take Psycho A and stop, that's fine. If you want to take Psycho A and B and then stop, that's fine. If you want to go on and take the plus lessons uh, that we offer during the summer, that's fine too. But uh, we found it's slowed down this race that we have in some areas that you, you've got to, uh, I think sometimes we hypercharge our dancers and they immediately uh, want to go from mainstream to plus and then immediately on to advanced and they're not stopping to enjoy the programs on the way. And perhaps by enforcing that they have to redo their basics again, we find that almost everybody repeats cycle B and in fact almost everybody takes the plus more than once because We've changed the culture. The culture is, ah, we need to do this at least a couple times. And that used to be the culture in square dancing 20 years ago. But then we went into this culture now where it's raced right through. And that's one of the culture changes I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, Randy, uh, this is Jim Wass, Riverdale, Maryland again. Randy earlier was talking about uh, uh, getting rid of the uh, level snobbery or at least reducing the level snobbery, and that happens in part because you have uh, the two groups on the same floor working together. Kenny, uh, in your program where you have the various floors, what kind of things do you do to uh, make the groups feel part of the same effort and uh, reduce that level snobbery? I did make a note to it that I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, the last tip of the evening, um, all the groups get together on the main floor and we dance um, at the common denominator, whichever the uh, youngest group is, youngest in square dance terms. We, we call it that level and have a tip together with three callers and it, always at least three squares, even if we're only dancing a square in each class. And it, uh, that's always pretty exciting and makes it, makes it a more exciting event when you have more than one square.
Hi, I'm Maisie Stevenson, Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, we have a multi-caller also, multi-cycle. We have three callers, of which Jim is one of them. Um, he works with Kenny in Maryland and with us in Virginia. But I want to address the problem of the low dancer turnout for classes. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the country, but our area was very badly affected by the crash at the Pentagon. I wasn't going to cry, but uh, we know several people who have, you know. So I think that had a lot to do with um, poor turnout this year for classes in September. People were not ready. Also, as Kenny said, we have too many other attractions like the Kennedy Center, the MCI Center, all the sports activities in our area. But uh, we're hoping, uh, as we say, we have a multi-level, so we're starting another class. This is the front side of your cassette. We term as an open event, a Saturday evening dance at midpoints throughout this program to give these people a chance to go out and kind of show off what they've learned and join in with other groups. And third question is, do you promote square dance attire to these groups? Um, I'm not sure what your first point was. Uh, how long is the evening? Or No, the time frame. Are you starting like at 6.30 and going to 9.30, oh, we go. 7 to 10, 8 to 11? Okay, well, our, our eight-week multi-cycle program goes from 8 to 10 uh, every Monday evening. That's uh, what we do. And your second question was, do we do other dances? Well, in the Washington, D.C. area, we have a callers organization that runs class level dances. Uh, on every other Friday, there's a dance on the Maryland side of the Potomac River. And every other Saturday, there's a dance on the Virginia side of the Potomac. And uh, we, we encourage our, uh, all the classes in the Washington metropolitan area, encourage their dancers to go to the class level dances. So they do get dances year round that they can go to. And these are, it's a progression. And each week there's three more calls added or whatever. And in fact, all the callers who are teaching in the area have this progression in front of them when they're teaching their classes. And uh, whatever rate that you're teaching your class, you do try to keep ahead of the class level progression, uh, which is kind of a slow progression so that no one feels threatened by it. Uh, and by the time April rolls around, we, even though a lot of us finish our classes in March, the progression may not have gone all the way to mainstream because there, we know that there are callers who take longer than that uh, in their classes. And, so and it's only for, that's only for a September start So there's strictly fun dances. Uh, there's no, no teaching or teaching. It's just no go teaching. have fun and relax. In fact, we don't even allow flyers to, that promote anything other than um, other class level dances or halfway dances okay. uh, at, at those evenings. And the third one was attire. And uh, square dance attire, we don't require it at the, the, the lessons, but uh, we, we uh, and in fact, we don't dress up every night, but uh, every few nights we, we, we wear our square dance attire. And the angels oftentimes come in square dance attire. And by the time uh, they get halfway through the class or, and they've seen other dancers and angels at these uh, Friday and Saturday night dances, they start picking up on it. And we try to invite... Um, there, there's a local uh, retread, uh, what, what do I want to say, recycle shop to bring square dance clothes in and uh, oftentimes someone whose uh, spouse has passed away or something will want to bring their clothes and we encourage that and uh, they, they, the attire is encouraged at some point but we don't push it on them at all. Okay, uh, one more question just thought of if I may. Um, on your eight week cycle, do you find you lose many from to the next cycle? Do the majority of them go, like when they come in, do they realize that it's a long-term plan, or do they just figure it's eight weeks, I'm here, I'm out, it's like a night school course? Um, we generally keep them the, the whole time. I'm finding more and more, I don't know why, uh, there's more and more singles coming out. And uh, the single ladies might only stay eight weeks when they realize that they're only dancing. Uh, well, we try to get them to dance quite a bit. But uh, you just, you know, sometimes you get overwhelmed with single ladies, and the ones that drop out will be the ones that just said, well, I can see their handwriting on the wall. Uh, but the couples that we get and uh, the ones who maybe hook up with a regular partner will stay for the whole 24 weeks. Actually, I want to address that issue because I think that's something that we all face today. Something that we have started doing with our single ladies is we recommend that they go ahead and take cycle A 
and then they repeat cycle A, dancing the other gender's part. So they could start as a boy, do cycle A, then dance as a girl, doing cycle A, and then move on to cycle B and do the same thing. Uh, they have the best of both worlds because when there are uh, extra single men around, they can dance the ladies' part, and when there aren't, they can dance the men's parts, so they can go back and forth. Um, somebody mentioned the 9-11 situation, and I think that almost every time you have something bad that happens, there are some good things that come out of it. And one of the good things I've seen is a resurgence of patriotism in this country. And one of the things that I've heard uh, a lot of people talk about, I've noticed this in a couple of demos, that we've had a lot more people interested in trying square dancing. Uh, they were talking about marketing earlier, and they were talking about we need to emphasize the health-based aspects. I also think it's very important that we express the fact that square dancing is an all-American activity. It's something that originated in this country, and um, that uh, the resurgence of patriotism is causing some additional interest in square dancing and we should uh, emphasize that advantage to our activity. Uh, two quick things for Randy. You, uh, you've got a cycle A and a cycle B which takes them to mainstream. You didn't say when you do the plus. That's during, we, do, we do the plus during the summer. Summer basically becomes a holding pro uh, uh, program for the people who started in January and then we offer an introduction to PLUS for the people who took Cycle B who want to continue Same plus. night? Same night? Same night. Same night. Wednesday uh, night. And in addition, uh, then the next fall, we either either I run or another caller in the region will run a, a full-fledged PLUS program for them. But there again, we're we're not pushing the progression part of it. I think that's part of what we need to do is people should want to go on to a different activity uh, or a different program within the activity uh, because they want to, not because it's expected. Yeah. Now, you had a lady who has been through the cycle A six times and has no interest in going on, so that begs the question, how do you charge for this thing? Does that lady pay one time for cycle A and she can go for cycle A forever? Or does everybody, including the angels, or except the angels, pay for every 15-week session? Everybody pays except the angels uh, for uh, uh, their sessions. We do five weeks at a time. And my essential belief is that we're providing entertainment from the beginning. Uh, an interesting thing I have on my uh, frequently asked questions, because I find dancers ask, actually ask this, is because they're dancers and they're used to a two and a half hour dance, is, well, don't you get complaints from the people who are taking the class that, gee, we're only getting to come an hour and 15 minutes and we're paying uh, $5 a person? Never have heard any complaint about that, because the fact of the matter is, if they take any sort of program or class any place, they're going to pay a lot more than $5 for the hour or hour and 15 minutes. The lady who's been there six cycles now. She, she has a wonderful time. In fact, I actually, mm. we found out, unfortunately, that uh, she has cancer, so we're going to lose her. She has pancreatic cancer. But she's had a wonderful time, and she continues to come and dance. And she's not considered an angel. She is not considered an angel. She's never When gone does somebody through. get to the point where they are an angel? When they've completed uh, mainstream. In fact, I want to go back to uh, one of this gentleman's questions before when he talked about Saturday night dances and ending points. Uh, we have gone from a single graduation to uh, a multiple uh, certificate of completion. And part of the reason we've stopped using the term graduation is graduation has a tendency to be an ending point. 
you graduate from high school, you're done with high school. You graduate from, uh, you know, whatever degree program you're in, and then you go off and you don't have anything to do with it anymore. So, yes, and, and that's part of the mode we're trying to get out of. But we want to honor the people who have progressed to a certain point. And, and specifically, we do give out certificates of completion for mainstream because there are mainstream clubs in the area, and we urge the people who have completed mainstream to go out and dance with those clubs. Before you start, I just wanted to, on the on the fee collection. We uh, I, I've told this one lady that uh, has wanted to keep coming back, or someone has asked me about you know who pays. Well, if they want to be guaranteed a spot in a square, then they're a class member and they pay. If an angel is going to sit out, if we don't need them, so if they want to be guaranteed a spot, then they then they have to pay. Virgil Forbes from Laurel, Maryland. I'm the third cohort of Jim and Kenny here. Uh, to comment two things, the, the fun dance, the open dance. F for the September class, Kenny already mentioned, the Callers Association has the Friday and Saturday night dances. But also, once our students get to about the 16-week point, what used to be considered the basic program when we had such, uh, both Kenny's Mainstream Club, which is about four miles away, and Jim's Mainstream Club, which is about five miles away, invite the members of the class to come to virtually all of the club dances to start dancing and start forming bonds between the club members and class members, those who haven't been angeling, so that our class members are getting lots of floor time before they finish the 24-week graduation at Mainstream. Uh, I do the same thing with my plus clubs and my other classes because my Mainstream club is almost 50 miles away, so uh, I don't get to get much rake off from the Mainstream multi-cycle for my clubs. But So that's, that's one. We do make sure that there are places to dance. Just dance, not in a teaching environment for each of our starts, be it September, November, January. Number two, the, the concept of square dance clothing. Um, we actually had our September start this year. Along about December, they got the ideas that the angels are coming and they see the skirts swishing and what have you. And we actually had to have a little sit down for 15, 20 minutes talking about clothing and some of them got clothing for Christmas, and the first time they wore them, they discovered they thought they danced better in square dance clothes. And since then, we can't get them out of them. And that's fine, but uh, the, our basic dress code at Square Roots, our clothing regulation is, you must wear clothing. <laughs> for those who don't want to go to the expense or hassle, we don't care for those who want them, and eventually, virtually all of them want them. That's why I really think this pushing square dance attire, be it federation or what have you, uh, is almost unnecessary because people find once they start wearing them, they feel like they're dancing better and they're having more fun. And since that's the bottom line of what we're selling, fun, be it in multi-cycle or federation, uh, once they discover where the fun is, our job is very much easier. We're going to take one more question, I believe, and then I'd like Chris to give his presentation of what his program's doing. And anyone else who's doing programs would like to okay. explain a little bit more about theirs, there'd be time too. Chuck Jaworski, Squad Illinois again. Uh, one of the big complaints that we had when I brought this idea up to the club was the fact that the, the group that didn't start in September, the group that started in January, wouldn't be able to go to the student dances. This is odd in our area because although most clubs do not have students, they all have student dances. <laughs> and, of, and oftentimes these dances are the most well-attended dances they have the whole year. They never seem to make the connection between people one and the easier level. But at any point, what I convinced them was that although the September group could, could go to the student dances that are offered, the other groups couldn't, why doesn't the club invite the people to the club and will design some tips for that level? And if, when we get to the point that we have enough people in this multi-cycle program, 
to go back to dancing no longer once a month, as most of our clubs do, but go back to a second time a month and make it just at the club level, or not the club level, but the class level. They accept that this is an explanation of not being able to go to student dances. Okay. Chris Pinkham, if you uh, kind of tell us a little bit about your program. and Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Chris Pinkham. I'm from Hillsborough, New Hampshire, and I am uh, pleased to say that the multi-cycle program works, and it is very successful if you want to work at it long enough to make it work. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, I parallel a lot of what Randy does, and I agree with a lot of what he says. And we now have five clubs in New England that are working with the multi-cycle program. Randy is one, I'm another, we have one in Maine, we have one in Massachusetts, another one in Massachusetts, and we have one in New Hampshire. And they're all showing signs of success. Randy has been doing this the longest. Um, I'm in my, I'm, we're going to start our third season this coming year. And just to give you a quick idea of what we do, we do a Wednesday night program. We do a three-hour program, and it is broken up into one-hour segments, and we call them phases rather than cycles. But the nice thing about the multi-cycle program is that you can call it whatever you want. That does not matter, but the way we break it down and the way we present it to our dancers it seems to be what's critical. Four years ago, I started asking our club to start looking at the multi-cycle program as a way of growing the club. They were down to maybe two or three sets on a good night, four if we were absolutely popping for the evening. Nowadays, we dance six on a slow night, and we dance nine and as many as ten on a busy night. We're getting full support from former club people who did the thing at first, it's not going to work, and all of a sudden their eyes are open, they're saying this is working. Our club has rolled over two CDs in the last year and a half. So they're making money, they're sharing it with me, which is nice, and uh, you know, well, that, that's part of it. I get a base rate, I get a split on the gate every Wednesday night, so the more people that show up, the better I do. The way we break this down is, very quickly, we have phase one from seven to eight, and phase one starts in September and we do a basic program so that by January, with any kind of luck, because one thing I learned a long time ago is I teach slowly. I do not push two, three, four calls in an evening. I have one hour to teach, so I don't spend a lot of time doing that. We take our time. By January, we might be finished with the basic list. Um, we also have a phase two program from eight to nine o'clock. This is our mainstream trainees. But we've always picked up from where the last cycle started or ended, so that they may not be into the mainstream program yet. We may be finishing up the last several calls of basic. But the other thing we've done is we've cr not created that set of expectations where people are expected to move on, boom, 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 rapidly from program to program. We've been able to step back from the brink and save the club because we don't push the programs any longer. It's a more relaxed environment. It's easier on the dancers and it's working for us. From 9 to 10 o'clock is reward time for the angels. This is our plus program from 9 to 10 o'clock. So I'm one busy guy for three hours. I have no breaks, quite literally. We, I work seven to eight. <clears throat> I get five minutes. I go eight to nine, five minutes, nine to 10 o'clock, five minutes. And then I drive 100 miles to get home. So I roll in about midnight on Wednesday nights, and I get up about nine o'clock the next morning. It's my night. It's my one week, to, one night, uh, one day of the week to sleep in. We are doing really well with this program. It's successful. Um, there, are, some of the implications are that uh, we we have uh, good support from the people. We don't do a graduation. That was one of the things I asked three years ago to stop doing. I don't believe in graduations for the same reason that Randy does. Not believe in them. We we provide a continuum. We also don't uh, we we also don't call them lessons. I call them sessions. We don't have class members. We have new dancers, and we've managed to change the terminology. And by changing the terminology, you also remold the expectations of the new people that come in. So we've made some changes. No graduation provides a continuum, and that way there's no end to what we do. So we don't say, well, you've graduated, and they say, great, next year we're bowling, okay? Next year they come back, and they pick up where they left off. So we start in September. We go right through to the end of July. Starting at the end of uh, summer, I start coming in every other week, and we, I have asked the club to bring in a new caller on the week that I am not there. 
gives me a break, but it also provides pers perspective for the new dancers because we're also finding that their one night a week to dance is on Wednesday night. They're not big on weekend dances because we have a lot of families that bring their children in. So on, we on weekends, they're doing something else. So we have a slightly different approach to the multi-cycle program. But the nice thing about it is it's like a chameleon. It can change its colors. It can change its shape. And you can mold this to any form that you want as long as you feel comfortable with the fact that people are learning how to dance on, dance with a Western style square dance flavor. So this is working. The other thing that we found, and I've talked to a lot of people in the last couple of days, I've heard some horror stories about clubs that do not allow children to dance in their groups. And that brings a tear to my eye, I have to tell you, because we welcome children and families, the result of which is that we now have about six to seven children that come in and dance. The youngest one is eight, eight years old, and then I have a uh, sight-impaired young lady who is about 15, and she and the youngest uh, child in the group are two of my best dancers. Um, often when an adult is trying to uh, turn in the wrong direction, it's the eight-year-old that uh, points them in the right direction. And I say, listen to the child. She knows exactly what she's doing. So this is where we are. I love the multi-cycle program. It has become the salvation for this club. Uh, they're making money hand over fist. They're doing well. And I'm very happy with what we have been doing. And last year, we had uh, Randy come in and help me out with my NECA clinic last year. I had other groups that have started to use this program. And we had a nice long afternoon seminar about how this is working. And we also looked at the negative sides of this, too. And ultimately, we found that there really aren't a lot of negative sides to the, to the, uh, to the, to the multi-cycle program. Just a question. You, you uh, um, mentioned that from 9 to 10, it's plus dancing. So I'm taking that it's a plus destination program, but you didn't tell us when the dancers learned plus. If uh, from seven to nine they're learning the basics in the mainstream, right. well, is that another night of the week or? Uh, it's all the same night. So, but, so when, when do night. they do that? And when do they learn plus? Right. You mean with regards to how many years they've been in? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just trying to figure out if you said from nine to ten they dance plus. The, who the who plus teaches them plus, and when does that happen? I do. Well, when does it happen? It happens in the third phase of the evening. Oh, from 9 to 10, you're teaching? Yes. Plus. Well, okay. It's an ongoing plus workshop, teach, you know, slash workshop. So oh, so in the course of the year, you just, it kind of evens out. You teach them if they come often enough. I don't want somebody d taking plus lessons in my group unless they've been dancing mainstream for two full years. Okay, so... so and I'm very adamant about that. Well, I'm not know. proud of you for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what do they, when they finish the uh, second phase... Right. Then uh, do you find that they go out dancing at the mainstream clubs in the area, or uh, they just well, keep taking phase two for two years? They can if they want. Again, with the multi-cycle program, the beauty of this is that if you're not ready to move on, you can stay within a specific program. So they just keep relearning the, uh, yeah, over and, and over? Yeah, but and you know, we also have exceptional people. They come in, they see what they need to do, they dance the program, they pick it up quickly, and they're ready to move on. So normally, by the end of the beginning of the second year, if they do want to come in and, and, and dance the PLUS program, they're ready. But we're also finding that because people are only dancing once a week, that uh, they're content to deal with the programs in phase one and phase two. And if they want to move on, then that's their option. So are you finding this is their only square dance experience then? They're not dancing anywhere They else? are going out slowly but surely. They go out, but it's, it's something that is not pushed. And whether that's intentional or not, whether I encourage them to go out or not, that's, that's what's going on at this point. So... Anybody have any questions about what we're doing? And I'll turn this back to you guys. Okay. Any other questions? I think one thing is we're seeing three different viewpoints, and they all have a different format of, of creating a successful program. It's a variable. It's a flexibility program. It works the way you want it to work. Set it up the way you would like to utilize it. And if it doesn't work quite the way you want it this year, adjust to it. Adjust it again next year. But there's a point in time where you're going to come up with a program that works for your area, for your situation. Um, Kenny has the benefit of having two other callers working with him. Ron, you're doing pretty much by yourself, do I understood it? Uh, Chris is pretty much by himself. And I think it's great that they can get callers working together, 
But if you don't have that luxury, it just means you got to work a little tougher. You have a little less uh, time to uh, to uh, take the breaks, as, as Chris said. But uh, it, it's one of those things you have to, to adjust it to your particular needs and capabilities. But it, it's there. It's not it's not cut in stone. It's flexible. Yeah. I want to go back to what my first point was, is that in order for the activity to start growing, we have to be innovative. The reason why my program works the way it does is it follows what the school system is willing to do for us in terms of halls. So that's part of the reason why we operate the way we do. So the circumstances you're in may in fact influence the program, but one of the beauties of multi-cycle is that it can be molded to fit what the needs are in your community for your group. I also want to uh, attack the uh, children's issue from another standpoint, and that is when you come to rebuilding the activity, that the fact of the matter is if you look at children's and teens clubs, on average they put out many more callers than any adult clubs do. They put out very large numbers of, of callers percentage-wise. Um, well, he does. I come from that. I started at 17 uh, in New England. Uh, I was discussing with Chris. You're probably talking 65% of the active callers in New England started as teenagers. So, if uh, and and the fact of the matter is that that's the progression. We need to have dancers across the spectrum. Since we've had uh, kids and we do demos, we go out of the way to make our squares as rainbow ages of dancers because I think otherwise people see a, a group that is retirement age, they assume that everybody who square dances is of retirement age. And we want to make sure that they understand that square dancing is a family activity and it's good for all ages. Yeah, Chris Pinkham again. One real, one quick comment. We are seeing in our area clubs folding quickly. And the other thing that we've been able to do is uh, bring some of those folks into our group because they're seeing an active, lively, healthy group on Wednesday nights. So we have a good number of retreads that have come in, and they're doing quite well. But just go back to the basic theory behind the multi-cycle program in that your September people bring in your January people. And... It works. For the last two years, the people that came in in September to join us said, we have friends that would like to try this. And instead of saying, you have to wait till next year in September, well, great. Bring them in in January. We're going to start this all over again. And lo and behold, that's exactly what they did. And we've had, uh, we've, th that's been one of the contributing factors to doubling the size of our group, September people bringing in the January people. And it, goes, it goes a step further. And that is the next September, your September people and your January people bring your next class. And that's where you get this pyramiding effect because many of us have watched the activity spiral down. But both Chris and I are experiencing a spiral upward. Things are going up. And that's because we retain more people. If you retain more people, then you have more people who are recruiting more people recruiting mean more people coming in the door, and so it just continues to roll on, and we're in that, that upward spiral. Yeah, I'm heading over to your direction. The other thing we're seeing is people say, well, we tried that. It didn't work. Okay. Well, you know, somebody said a long time ago, said, don't try. Do it, because if you just try, it's not going to happen. If you do it, it's really going to work for you. If, you. if you try it once and it didn't work, try it again. Actually, that's part of what I'm going to say. I'm... This is a progress report. I want to be able to report to you next year how it works out, too. I've got two clubs in two different towns about 50 miles apart that are using multi-cycle for the first time. Um, started out with a lot of enthusiasm, and now I've got through the first, um, what, seven months approximately, and some of the, the changes are beginning to 
to hit home and they're starting to say, well, it's not going to work. We're going to have to go back to the old program. And now I've got to get through. The, we've got to keep trying it, just like it says in, in the, the handout. Stay with it. Um, but the enthusiasm that they had at the beginning of the year, if I can just keep it going, um, it's, and, and the other problem that I really have to deal with, and it's the one that I don't have an answer for because our entire area, even though they're small, smaller rural areas, PLUS is the only level that there are clubs. PLUS and advanced get this. Um, and trying to get the multi-cycle integrated into that is uh, a real challenge. You need to just start mainstream clubs out of your group and forget about it. <laughs> um, what is you said you're doing multi-cycle? Are you doing a September and a January class, or uh, and yes. did the January class go? Uh, did you yes. get both had classes? Good, we both clubs had good turnouts for both the September and January, and uh, basically what we're going to do is through the summer is the holding pattern uh, type level. But I still really have the problem of I'm begging the issue of how to get them on up to uh, to plus unless I can get the clubs to come off their plus high horse and that's maybe talk one tough. of them to stay in mainstream <laughs> actually I, I'm, I'm going to approach that because that is an issue that certainly uh, we had in getting going and I got them to stay the course the second year and then once we hit the third year and we really started seeing the wave rising and, and, and Chris is uh, motioning to me that he's seen the same thing all of a sudden, the club was not subsidizing lessons. They were making income from lessons. And they realized that, hey, wait a minute. We were losing money for years and years. If we're making money on lessons, then we don't have to worry quite so much about how fast they're getting through. The real case is that they're getting through and they're staying with the activity. And... Uh, it's literally a culture change that uh, exists within the club. There's also another change that happens when you get to the five or six year level. And that is, I could never get the club to go back to regular lessons. Because everybody who's on the e-board, save one person, came through the multi-cycle program. Because you have you have all these dancers and uh, the thing that was most revealing to myself and I hadn't even thought of it was I was asked at one local club would you please talk about your multi-cycle program and the president of Matt Hatters was with me and uh, I was talking about it and he came up to me and said gee I didn't realize that our lessons were different than anybody else's I can dance just as well I can do everything else just as well. But the fact of the matter is we have a lot more people. And, you know, they, they would never consider going back because the enthusiasm is there. To, the culture has changed. We're headed in the right direction. And we're watching, as Chris is, clubs around us dying. And they're saying, what do we do to save ourselves? But they refuse to change. And if we don't change, if we don't innovate, you don't have to do it the way Randy Page does it. You don't have to do it the way that Kenny Ferris does it, or Virgil Forbes, or Chris Pinkham. You can do it what's good for you. But do something. That's the way we're going to continue to survive. One more question. Okay, Jim, last. Um, Clay Goss, Newark, Delaware. Uh, my question to all of you uh, is, could you speak to how you feel the difference between your two programs and therefore other programs that are similar to one or the other, how they might be different as far as uh, making dancers feel more part of the club group in that Kenny and Jim's and Virgil's format has the dancers separated whereas your formats have them dancing together, integrated. I believe what they're... Do you what understand you're, my question? I believe they are having them dance together. No, they're, they're, theirs, they have three halls going at the same time. They dance, okay. one, they dance one tip in the evening together. 
but yeah, they're they're doing their own thing. They go up and watch the other groups. I mean, just like uh, and probably in the in the other type of sessions where the uh, the A group stays and watches the B group, uh, that goes on here too. But obviously, uh, everybody's learnt doing their own class, so they can't join the other class at the same time. Um, I, I don't know if that's a benefit or not, but I do like the way Randy does it. He's making me think. <laughs> Well, but I, I think the key here, Kenny, is that there's some sort of social interaction going on uh, between the dancers. What I've seen is that it eases the transition. We always used to talk about the class to club transition. Well, before it was one big step. Now it's a group of little steps. And their friends have done it before them. And only a few months before them, so there aren't these long periods. Uh, I really like the illustration that someone used, and that is that one of the uh, problems we have with square dancing is if you take uh, square dancing is like a limited access highway. Uh, the problem we had was we had one entrance per year and an unlimited number of exits available per year, and that we need to have more opportunities for people to enter in and join the activity. And I'm not saying we, we can't do anything about the people who get sick. But if we have opportunities that will allow us to retain additional people, and I think the social interaction part of square dancing is very important. If we only focus on the choreographic aspect, we, we can't focus on just any one aspect. We have to focus on the activity as a whole. And so I guess what we're saying, at least from my viewpoint, is is we need to change the culture. And my way of changing the culture is the multi-cycle program. Our social climate is very strong in this group. Three different groups, but there's total blending with regards to friendships because we have grandparents in with with their sons and daughters and the grandchildren are in and they're all in the different groups at, at different times so social interaction is very strong. Let's be our last question please. Are you done? Okay. Again, uh, we want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I think as you can tell the three of us on stage are very very optimistic with this program. Would you please uh, give a big hand to our presenters? Mr. Kenny Ferris, Ron Page, thank you very much. Also, Chris Pinkham for not only giving his presentation, but passing the mic. We thank you all.